basically you have areas of grappling that are really linear and you have areas of grappling that are really chaotic. In the chaotic areas, you need heuristics and you need a certain amount of intuition. And the more uh, like developed your intuition and your heuristics are in that chaotic area of grappling, the better you're going to be at getting to the areas where you can be really systematic and like, okay, now I got to my over-unders, I'm going to do this pass and I'm going to da 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 da. So, uh, so much of what we do in grappling is pretty chaotic and the ability to develop the, like your skills, your, your movement skills, your reactions, your intuition in that is highly dependent on your ability to recognize that these are things that, excuse me, that can be trained. It's getting like, it's very much in vogue now for people to work on their guard retention. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, something I've been thinking a lot about recently is this idea of intuition and the scales at which intuition is useful. I think we evolved under certain circumstances, kind of on the scale of a millimeter to 10 or 50 kilometers. And we're pretty good at understanding our environment in that sense. And we're pretty good at understanding people on a scale of one person to 150 to 200 people. And, and we, we really have good intuitions about what other people are going to do and about what happens in that environment. But our intuitions also fail us outside those ranges. I mean, the classic example that I always think of is our intuition never predicted a black hole. Right? There's nothing out there that goes, hey, you know, I'm going to put so much mass together, it's going to collapse and form a singularity. And it's going to create this black nebulous thing that sucks in all energy and all light and all mass. And oh, by the way, it spits off giant amount of gamma rays too. That, that's not something that people arrived at through intuition. That's something they arrived at through mathematics. And we needed mathematics in that situation because our intuition didn't work anymore at that scale. And similarly, our intuition isn't really very useful about the way that electrons circle an atom or whether a neutrino interacts with a particle that it's passing through. And at the quantum scale, at the, even the molecular and atomic scale, our intuitions really stop working. And so this got me thinking about the role of intuition in jujitsu and martial arts. So I thought I'd bring in my good friend, Rob Bernacki here, and we would talk about intuition in the martial arts. Oh. So how are you doing, Rob? I'm doing as well as can be expected. I'm quite pleased that you were thinking about quantum physics and jujitsu, and I'm the guy you thought to talk about. So, <laughs> well, you know, I thought we could, we could, you know, solve several, solve several paradoxes tonight. And, uh, you know, it just on our way to, uh, to solving jujitsu, we could also you know, solve the question of dark matter in the universe and, and all dark energy and all those kinds of things. Are you, are you down? Well, I, I mean, isn't it just part of the firmament? <laughs> well, how do you feel <laughs> about dark energy? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm, I'm down I, for a talk about uh, how intuitions fail us and, and how we can uh, train our intuition so that it doesn't fail us. Right. I think a lot of people's intuitions were wrong. And a lot of people were shocked because their intuitions were so wrong in UFC one, right? When, when you and I started watching sure, the yeah. UFCs back in the early nineties and really nobody thought that this 179 skinny kid would have any chance against these really big, really tough looking guys. Right? I mean, these guys had muscles yeah, and some of them had tattoos <laughs> and some of them were obviously badass and they could throw a hell of a punch and they all got taken down and taken out of their, their element and it looked nothing like a fight that you saw in the movies. Yeah, well, and I, and I think the movies is kind of the key word there, which is that the vast majority of people got all of their information about fighting from movies. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. you know, it, combined with poorly developed intuition uh, about something that most people, at least in our, you know, in our society as of the 1990s, most people had never been in a fight or anything close to a fight. I, I think that uh, intuition about what works in a fight would have probably been a lot more highly developed at different points in our history in different civilizations. But in the 90s, see, sorry, I'd been in a reasonable number of fights in grade school and high, sc high school, and even you know, a couple in early university. And every single one of them turned into a grappling match. Every single one of them yeah. turned into a grappling match. And still, I thought that this somehow didn't register. It was like, this is a whole bunch of data, but when it comes to fighting, you know, Bruce Lee is the man, basically. Like, or, 
or Mike Tyson's the man, or, you know, uh, the boxers are the men. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the data coming in from real life, which is, you know, it turned into things like Tomonage, it turned into things like Kubinage, a headlock throw, it turned into the mount, yeah. it turned into ground and pound. Just, it for me, it didn't register until, I mean, for me, I started shifting at about uh, the Gracian action videos. And also when Danny Nasanto started saying things like, look, in Japan, they're, they've got early MMA, what he called early MMA, yeah. and most of the matches end on the ground. I started, that got me thinking, but I, I never thought of this myself. Yeah, well, and, and again, you, you wouldn't because all of our knowledge about fighting was coming from movies. And if it wasn't coming from movies, like you said, it was it was Mike Tyson. It was it was boxing, professional boxing. That was the only um, combat sport that was really part of the cultural zeitgeist for decades. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, maybe if we had grown up in the time of you know, Farmer Burns and, and catch wrestling being a thing in whatever the, the 20s, then we would have had a different uh, notion uh, and a different instinct as to what fighting was. But considering where we were as a society and where we were as participants in that society, how could you know? Every single thing you had seen, every piece of media you had seen was somebody punching or kicking somebody to end a fight. Yeah, I'll, I'll go further back than that. I mean, one day I'll get you going about the historical European martial arts. <laughs> but if you take a look at the actual manuals that are written by, you know, some German dude in 1600, there's a hell of a lot of grappling in there too. Clearly those guys knew that once you clash, that it's going to turn into a grappling match. I mean, there's a reason that the Filipinos do a lot of work with sword and dagger. Because once the sword gets tied up... The dagger's necessary. Yeah, because they're at like super close range. They're at grappling range and you can sewing machine a guy with a dagger yeah. that you can't chop him up with a sword. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, the, the, the intuition that most people had going into this uh, as, a, as a spectacle, as an event was completely underdeveloped in the sense that like, yeah, what, what our intuition had been incorrectly developed by the, the media consumption that we'd had for 20, 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. And do you think that when people find, like, let's say somebody watched the early UFCs or gets converted somehow to the efficacy of some kind of grappling, you got to be, do some kind of grappling. So they're aware of it and they go into a grappling context and they start as a white belt, say yep. their intuitions, many of them really, really don't serve them well. I mean, the classic example is bench your way out of, uh, bench press your way out of the bottom of the map. Yeah. That's, that's the mistake that every beginner makes or turn your back when somebody's passing your guard, which is not always wrong, but we'll call it wrong initially. If, yeah. For someone who doesn't know how to grand B or, or, or high leg or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's very wrong. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Those, I mean, the, one of the phrases that I use when I teach, especially beginners, uh, is I tell them training is teaching you the difference between what you want to do and what you should do. <laughs> because what we want to do is almost always wrong. Like we have a, a bit of an intuitive idea. Like, I mean, I mean, nowadays with the rise of MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there are a lot more people coming in that actually do have a bit of an idea of what to do. Like the, that's sort of like stick your arm up and bench press your way out of Mount. I don't see that the way I used to like that. That was something that you, you had to really like, True. You know, every single beginner class 10, 15 years ago, you had to drill that into people's heads. I don't see that much anymore. Like I, I've had students pull off guillotine chokes that have never learned a guillotine choke from me because they've just had so much exposure to it. And it's a fairly rudimentary technique that a bit of instinct, you, you can figure your way through a guillotine choke if you're a strong enough guy with a bit of instinct. I've seen homeless people in downtown Vancouver applying guillotine chokes, then pulling guard. Yeah. So I, I think this has entered the cultural zeitgeist that, you know, they, they're probably not doing the, the perfect form on that guillotine choke, I'm guessing. But, uh, you know, the idea that you can take somebody out by wrapping their head and then with their arms and then wrapping their body with your legs, that is now an idea in the same way that I knew for sure that hauling off and throwing a big right hand would for sure drop the guy. Which, yeah, exactly. The, so, well, the first I, time I think, you do full contact sparring, it's really depressing <laughs> to hit the guy with your Sunday your Sunday punch, and he just and the guy just kind of looks at you. 
Yeah. But that was supposed to knock you out as it does in all the movies. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, the, the, if I'm not that we've proved anything, but I, I think this opens people's eyes to the idea that what you think of as intuition, which is to say, this is just something inside me that has not been influenced uh, by anything. This is just, uh, you know, it's my gut feeling. It's it's my senses. That is so prone to your surroundings and and how you grew up and what you watched and what you saw as far as what becomes your intuition about something like we have intuitions that are you know bred into us by uh you know evolution there we definitely have like you know that's a big loud sound and you have a startle reflex uh, you know we've got we've got intuitive reactions well the flinch reaction is intuitive when something somebody throws something at your head it doesn't matter what kind of media you consumed. Your intuitive reaction is to bring your hands up. Mm -hmm. But what people... That's a little bit more, I don't know, primal than most of the things that we mean by intuition. People have intuitions that they're going to win the lottery tonight. People have intuitions of, you know, Which the is, right way to get out of mount. Yeah, so... But people have intuition. That's what I'm saying is like there, there is what is actually intuition, which is a, hmm. a pretty automatic thing. It's something that uh, that happens regardless of, uh, you know, outside factors. Uh, that, you know, when I say outside factors, I mean like processes outside of your head. Uh, hmm. And then there's intuition, which is, like I said, you know, there's uh, okay. the, the intuition that... Like an astrology is something you know, like I think the planets influence. Like people have an intuition about that. They're like, I just I've got a feeling. You know, when when the stars align, uh, that's all nonsense. That that sort of intuition is pretty much just gibberish. It's fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's but intuition it's been formed by their environment. At some yeah, point, exactly. Somebody told them. Yeah, somebody told them, and so now they because they haven't been willing to put in the time and energy to develop their cognition to the point where they can actually think enough to draw conclusions based on valid information, they just make shit up that makes them feel good or seek shit out that confirms something, some idea that they have that makes them feel good. Uh, and they've got a feeling, their intuition tells them, hey man, this is gonna happen. So yeah, like the, the word intuition Unfortunately, okay. it's like I, I, I uh, several times in my life I've explained to people that the word uh, want has two meanings. The word intuition has two meanings. Like the word want can mean a statement of intended action or it can mean a desire. Like if somebody says, you know, I want to mow the lawn this weekend. That's not really saying that they desire to mow the lawn. It's like that's something I'm going to do. And then they mm -hmm. say like, man, I want to be rich yeah what are you doing to make that happen oh you're playing the lottery well maybe you got an intuition that you're gonna win like it, it's about as valid as all that so intuition can just be something that you think is gonna happen for sweet fuck all reason whatsoever which is what it is for the majority of people the majority of the time when, when we talk about it in our society or intuition can be a very highly developed sense of and you know, as it's going to relate to jujitsu or, or martial arts, it's just going to be a sense of moving at, in the right way at the right time without a, a clear thought ever going through your head. You, you're not going to think, oh man, I should grab that guy's wrist and move right now. Your body just does it. So that is intuition that, uh, you know, I would argue that some people have a genetic predisposition to that, but can also be highly developed. Okay. So I would think that to develop your intuition so that it's actually useful, it really depends on your knowledge base. Absolutely. Right. I mean, the, so you've got to basically fill in as well. And there, there's a couple different things going in, going on. But if you know 10 different ways to do the guillotine and then you're not in the exact right position to do it, you now understand enough about the mechanics of the guillotine that maybe you can do it just one handed. Yeah. Even if you've never done a one-handed guillotine before, because it's kind of like this and you kind of know your body kind of knows where you need to put your wrist and kind of know how to generate force. Yeah. If so you, it relies on that previous body of knowledge. If that, that body of knowledge was acquired through like, you know, hands-on experience of a lot of varied situations. So like if the, if the knowledge that you gained of 10 different guillotines was, you drilling them without any resistance, 
May, probably not. If you your knowledge came from looking at pictures or watching a video, definitely not. But if it came from you just having experimented, learned the guillotine and experimented with it throughout the course of your grappling, uh, then definitely. Okay. Can you give some other examples of how, well, what about you? When has your intuition served you well and when has it served you poorly? Uh, where, where, on the map, yeah, yeah, not talking about your love life. Woo! No love life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one positive. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, we might get pretty deep into the weeds here because what I've actually tried to do in my career as a as a grappler and very much so as an instructor is try to develop methods of uh, teaching people how to develop intuitive and adaptive reactions. So we, you know, in the in the instructionals that we've done, we've talked about the the fuck your jujitsu methodology, uh, right. and how that is this and and the and the concepts that we teach, the as being a method of creating an adaptable problem solving algorithm. So that where you're always trying to get back to base, where you're trying to make fix your posture, yeah. where you're trying to have correct structure. Exactly, and and, and the other concepts apply too, like the idea of mo sure. momentum and center of gravity, or having like posts and force vectors, all that stuff. Having all of that knowledge. I mean, if, if all you have is that knowledge, it'll be effective to a point, but, uh, and if you have like systems, like obviously everything I teach to a certain degree is, uh, systematic, but some parts of grappling are really prone to effectiveness through systems. Whereas other parts are not at all prone to effectiveness through, uh, like really regimented or codified systems. And if you only use that one method, then there's going to be a limitation to how well you can develop. So I like, can you give an example of what is amenable to having a system and what is amenable or less amenable to having a system? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, and uh, by the way, I like, uh, I'm going to be, this is uh, some of the stuff, uh, that I'm going to be talking about. I learned way back when some of the stuff, uh, I'll be referencing if you, if you want to look it up, uh, there's a great Instagram account, um, and it's it's called School of Grappling. The guy's name is Andy, uh, and he does a lot of posts about this sort of stuff, and he's sort of the first guy that I've seen talk about it outside of uh, myself and, and, and my academy where, we, where we've talked about it, which is um, the idea is that there's a – like. I guess there's a, there's a spectrum of complexity, and I, I'm going to occasionally like look stuff up here uh, while I'm doing this. Um, so the there are two two words that you will have heard me use an awful lot in my classes or in training, which is uh, obviously like systems and then heuristics. So the, the a heuristic is just like it's a, like a mental shortcut. It's a it's a quick easy rule of thumb that gets the job done a lot of the time. Whereas and and, and a heuristic will allow you to create a lot of adaptability and variability and still have a pretty good answer. So, so what's an example of a heuristic? I think like my grip or no grip. Yeah, that, that's a very good example of, of a heuristic, right? Like the, where the head goes, the body follows is a good example of a heuristic. There are lots of them in grappling, right? Not a hundred percent true a no. hundred percent of the time, but good enough for the girls I go out with. Like, let's start with 90% <laughs> of the time. Don't let the guy get a grip. Yeah. Uh, so the, like a heuristic or a, uh, like, um, a non-systematic and not like, a, a, you know, a, a, where a system will exceed, will succeed exceedingly well will be in a scenario where you can control almost all the variables. So like having systems for submission control positions, like, you know, the, we always talk about, a, a, you know, a, a submission is really a position that you should first control. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Kimura control is a system. Sure. The the guillotine is a system. The triangle is a system. Those things really excel with systematic methodology because you can control the variables. Uh, you know, uh, guard passing, while you can have subsystems where like, okay, if I get to, you know, if I get to the over under, or I get to there's a limited under, number of things the guy can do. You can have a system because we've narrowed things down. But if you take a step back and like, we're just talking about, I'm trying to pass your guard and, and you know, we've, we, we've gone, we're in the engagement phase. Nobody's established grips yet. And I'm going to try to pass your guard. That is inherently chaotic or nonlinear. So if you're going to try to, from no grips, 
just be like, okay, I'm going to get my grip and then I'm going to do this pass to forget it. Yeah. You know, Cause you get your grip, the guy breaks it and he does something like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay. Let me start again. I got my grip and then I'm going to, ah, oh, fuck. And then like, you just, you just like, you're spamming the B button in a video game and the other guy's spamming another button and like nothing happens. So to develop like the more, uh, chaotic areas so like basically you have areas of grappling that are really linear and you have areas of grappling that are really chaotic in the chaotic areas you need heuristics and you need a certain amount of intuition and the more uh, like developed your intuition and your heuristics are in that chaotic area of grappling the better you're going to be at getting to the areas where you can be really systematic and like, okay, now I got to my over unders, I'm going to do this pass and I'm going to da 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 da. So, uh, so much of what we do in grappling is pretty chaotic and mm -hmm. the ability to develop the, like your skills, your, your movement skills, your reactions, your intuition in that is highly dependent on your ability to recognize that these are things that, excuse me, that can be trained. It's getting like, it's very much in vogue now for people to work on their guard retention. Uh, you know, there are quite a few excellent instructionals out about it. There used to be zero instructionals. Like I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that our guard retention section in the BJJ formula was one of, if not the first, one of the first. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah like ways of, uh, like instructional attempts to teach guard retention. Because if you try to teach guard retention the way that most people are used to teaching jujitsu, which is, hey, okay, everybody, we're gonna do this move today, and then you and have here's to, the counter to and that here's move. the counter to that move, et cetera, et cetera. That's really difficult. You you have to gamify it. You have to uh, you have to create a a methodology for giving people a lot of variables and allowing them to use the, the heuristics. And there's a general set of movements you're going to use when you're doing guard retention, but it, it has to be pretty... The high leg, the hip Yeah, escape, all that stuff, know. yeah. Um, and you, you've got to learn those movements. You've got to drill them to the point where you're conversant with them. You can perform them under pressure. But then after that, you got to make a little bit of a game out of just doing guard retention when, where someone's trying to pass your guard. And if you try to do it when you're rolling, it won't work. Yeah. Because th there are too many variables in this like skill between you and your opponent, and if somebody's really good at passing and they just get strong grips on you, and uh, then you know, or if you're got a, if you're a really good offensive guard player and you're really good at getting your grips, you don't spend much time in the retention phase. You're just attacking people, uh, so you have to uh, you know what most people would call situational sparring, but situational sparring is too um, it's too competitive and it's too and it's uh, you're certainly not developing you know intuition when somebody's a hundred like okay we're gonna do the knee cut and i'm gonna try to pass your guard you're definitely not developing intuitive reactions so the the instructional that i did with rory yeah. uh, your black belt had lots of footage of him doing guard retention specific training yeah. and i know that you and i have talked about fuck your jujitsu training before on this podcast and as a way of being a kind of a low consequence, high benefit type of training for people who haven't diligently listened to all 300 plus episodes that I've done. First of all, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Start at the beginning or else. Uh, second of all, could you talk about how you would do fuck your jujitsu with for guard retention? Yeah, absolutely. So how would you gamify that yeah. and lower the consequences, but, maintain that ability to develop your intuition in a fluid chaotic environment yeah totally so fuck your jujitsu is a uh type of restricted so as opposed to situational rolling because you know let's say we're going to situational spar the half guard that's very uh, segmented and we're, there's still a strong competitive aspect to it so like we wouldn't do fuck your jujitsu with something like that that's a little bit too specific um, what we would do with fuck your jiu-jitsu is we create a restriction on one participant. So in the case of fuck your jiu-jitsu passing, the restriction is on the guard player. You are not allowed to sit up and engage with like, there's no hand fighting. So there's no engagement phase. You play recumbent or supine guard. You're on your back. 
and you allow your opponent to grab your ankles, which you know, uh, normally if I didn't want someone to pass my guard, excuse me, I wouldn't let them grab my ankles or grab my pants without immediately re-gripping them or breaking the grip. So for the purposes of this, you're allowing them to gain control and then they're gonna try to pass your guard. You are not allowed to slow them down in the sense of like, you can't close your guard, you can't make butterfly hooks, you can't grab uh, their wrists and, and break grips or anything like that. You can only utilize frames, replacing frames with your legs, you can high leg, you can granby, you can do all this kind of stuff. Uh, so we, we we put in a very specific restriction so that the guard player has zero opportunity to use their guard offensively. They can only respond to guard passing attempts. And what this creates is a, a really, I mean, for one, it's hella exhausting. Like it just, having, just trying to like spam guard passes on someone who's just doing guard retention is incredibly tiring for the top guy and it's incredibly tiring for the bottom guy to just be constantly doing it. There's really no opportunity to slow down. You just, you're constantly going. So there's, it, it, it trains the, the chaotic aspect of like in a match, if I want to pass a good guard, I just got to be prepared to battle it out for several minutes at a pretty significant level of intensity. Uh, so that, so that drill is mostly for the guy on top. I mean, there are benefits for the guy on the bottom too. Oh no, it's it's actually the the benefits I would say are pretty equal. The the mm -hmm. guy on the bottom is developing their ability to uh, react to uh, like guard passing routes and uh, like changes in direction and somebody chaining passes together because you never have an opportunity to really interrupt a passing chain. You okay, you've just got to enough. deal with it. So in terms of diff like what Rory was doing, you could call it specifically working on guard retention, but that was actually fuck your jujitsu passing that he was doing uh, because the top guy was just doing whatever passing they wanted and Rory was very specifically restricted from using his guard offensively, mm -hmm. so he had to just do guard retention. And then the, the top guy is developing their intuition for like, when is the right time to do this pass? When is the right time to switch directions? When is the right time to go for uh, a double unders because I'm not getting anywhere trying to work through uh, you know, these particular frames? So both participants are equally developing different aspects of the game. The same way that when we do fuck your jiu-jitsu sweeping, the top guy is not allowed to pass. They're not allowed to flee. They have to just hang out in the guy's guard and let the guy try and sweep them. And so the bottom person is getting to develop sweeps against somebody who is really actively fighting to maintain base and pop back up when they get knocked down. So both guys are developing uh, like extensive um, like reactions that they just would not normally face in a sparring round. If I was trying to not get swept and I know you've got a good butterfly guard, I would just avoid your butterfly guard at all costs. Yeah. You know, it reminds me a little bit of is this idea to create more reps. And uh, I don't surf, yep. but I follow the surfing world. It's a cool world. And if you want to be a world class surfer, you got to wait in the ocean for a long time for decent waves to come by. Yep. But now you've got these wave farms or these artificial surfing areas mm -hmm. where you get a perfect wave that's every the same time. every time. Yeah. And you get it at pre predictable intervals. So you can just get a whole lot more reps in. Well, that was, and, it's, it's uh, funny you mentioned that because that was the idea behind it. The idea behind fuck your jujitsu was you need to get reps, but dummy reps are useless for developing intuition and reaction time and, and that adaptable problem solving algorithm. What we want is as close to live sparring as possible. But again, as soon as we introduce the idea that there are other goals, the goal becomes to win. The goal becomes, well, okay, we're rolling. I want to submit you. So if I've got a particular sweep that I'm really good at, I'm going to use my A sweep and you're going to avoid it. And you get these, they're, they're, these are very different battles. I, I would say that, and I mean, you know, maybe it's changing now, but certainly when I was working on developing this stuff, I would say that 90 plus percent of roles were at a level of intensity where it was exceedingly hard to develop anything unless you were just way better than the other guy. Like if you've got a huge skill disparity, you can use rolling. You can do whatever, you, do whatever you, want. you want. Yeah, you can use rolling to develop new skills. Uh, right. and, and in that sense- Which is a valid thing. Oh, if, yeah. if you just have a bunch of white belts and you're a purple belt or a brown belt, 
then you go, this is going to be, I don't know, Kimura week, and I'm only going to finish the Kimura and only on the left arm. 100%. But, but those, those, those are not ideas that were common 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Like it, one of the, the ways that, that I developed this fuck your jiu-jitsu stuff to a certain degree was watching Ryan Hall roll at his academy. And I mean, Ryan's been a, a huge uh, in, inspiration and influence on my, my jiu-jitsu career and my teaching methodologies. And so, but like I'd never, ever seen anyone roll uh, the way that Ryan rolled. Like he was so clearly, you know, I mean, I, at the time, uh, you know, I don't think he had any training partners at his academy that were, you know, at the, I shouldn't say any, but like, you know, the, the vast majority of his training partners at, at his academy were, you know, orders of magnitude lower than him in skill level. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you just come in and smash those guys with your A game, like cool, but you don't really get any better. Uh, and just, like I said, the way that he rolled and the way, like he was basically like literally standing on people, like surfing on them and just doing all kinds of really cool stuff that you don't normally see. And, you know, you could tell he was just getting in reps, but he was getting in reps live on sparring partners. And so what, what I tried to do is take that, like the, the ethos of that, the idea that, okay, I'm going to try to use my rolling time to develop new skills by focusing on certain things and working on my timing. And I just tried to codify that approach into a, uh, a sparring methodology that regardless of how stubborn or meatheaded or aggressive somebody wanted to be, they couldn't break the rules or cheat the system enough to get around the fact that we were going to make them develop new skills and intuition and reaction time and all that. So do you think intuition just mainly comes from like, I tried this three times, it failed three times, time to try something new and that it, it, Uh, it's kind of trial and error in real time? No, I I think it comes from like, if we want to get arcane about it, I think it comes from, uh, are you familiar with what myelin is? Yes. Yeah. So I think it just comes from enough myelin coding that you're able to respond so quickly. There's, um, and again, like if you want to look up way more um, in depth on this, look up School of Grappling. It's, um, I believe it's called action perception coupling. And you, you're going to get to a point of ability with something where like the, 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 the slightest inclination of a thought in the direction of that movement will trigger that movement. It's like if you've seen <laughs> footage of like fighters sometimes watching fights and they're literally like reacting to what's going on because they're seeing like there's a there's a connection between you know our our brain and our body that works in ways we don't fully understand and if once once you've performed movements enough times and you have a solid like understanding whether it's the understanding that i focus on with like base posture structure and all that or whether it's more of a um, you know, a subconscious understanding, which I think that all of the greats have a level of understanding human movement that might not be, they might not be able to explain it in words the way that, that I try to explain it. And frankly, the reason I can't explain it with words is I'm not that good at it just on a purely physical level. So I've had to try to uh, intellectualize it to a certain degree. Uh, But all of those greats have that kind of understanding of movement. And so you can, that understanding of movement can come from uh, just you know, years of training, and it becomes intuition, or the like the the conceptual stuff can inform your movement, and then it becomes intuition. So I think we can arrive at it, uh, you know, from our brains first or from our bodies first. But either way, it requires years and years of experience uh, in those kind of chaotic situations. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. I mean, the gap is closing now, but for years, the intuitions that high-level jiu-jitsu black belts had, which served them very well for chokes and guard sweeps and takedowns and uh, uh, all the standard classical Brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff didn't serve them at all for leg locks. Like, they would do exactly the wrong thing. Yeah. And uh, it's like they had to then go back to school and presumably they caught up a lot faster than, than some blue belt would have mm-hmm. because they, they're, they're just better at learning. 
but there was a very definitely a, a time and that's still a little bit there that yeah. the the intuitions are still not always dialed in correctly which is again just another example of like it, if we want to talk about intuition and how much it relies on education or training or exposure or experience or expertise you would think if anybody would have grappling intuition it would be an experienced jujitsu black belt and yet faced with uh you know a, a system of techniques an approach to grappling that is you know a little bit counterintuitive they didn't spontaneously develop the right answers there's a whole lot of jiu-jitsu black belts that have got this kind of story associated with them i've heard it with from marcelo garcia but i've also heard of this from high level freestyle wrestlers so you can catch them in the move once but then they go home and they stew about it yeah and then they come back the next day and you're never going to catch them in that same move ever again so their their learning curve has been abbreviated that you get one rep on them yeah and then uh you know maybe a second if you're you know ungodly skilled and then never again yeah i, I wonder how much of that is honestly like it's a bit apocryphal but it's i i have seen it in, i have seen it in action I, I mean with uh with high level wrestlers like where something that worked on them you know like uh you know, flying, flying leg locks worked on day one. And then just day two is like, nope, they, they, they were up all night figuring out how to shut that down. And cause they were Olympic caliber. They didn't like it at all. Right. <laughs> they just had a super violent reaction. To yeah, that. definitely. And I mean, the, the more, the more narrow the, um, the situation that that applies in, the more you'd be able to do that. Yeah. Sure. If, if somebody is just spamming a flying leg attack, definitely you'll only get the one but if they have a really yeah. good ability to just get to a position uh in a variety of ways i i kind of doubt that that would be possible after you know like you get them once and never again but again that, that just i i think that that ties in really well with the idea of you know the the more complex the situation is sure. the more you need a certain amount of intuition whereas the more narrow it is the the less you need it and you can focus on specific learning so when I'm training reasonably hard, which has not been this year because <laughs> my training situation is uh, um, obviously heavily modified, but in a normal time of training, it's amazing how often I get into a position, especially with a gi, but even without the gi, where I'm like, man, I've never been here before, or at least if I've been here before, I can't remember it. And it's, I'm sure the same has happened to you, probably not that long ago. Yeah, so... <laughs> One of the reasons that I like, I think I'm probably better at jujitsu than I should be given my level of like physical ability and athleticism because I'm, I'm a poor athlete and my body is not, it doesn't hold up to the rigors of heavy training. So in terms of like actual mat time and rolling time, I'm probably way below most guys that you know are my age and have been training as long as I have, et cetera, et cetera. But I will say that because of the the way that I train and because of the fuck your jiu-jitsu methodology, that notion and like I do remember it. I do remember very often ending up in positions like, oh, that's weird. I've never been here before. Oh, that's weird. I've never been here before. That really doesn't happen to me that often anymore because of the way that I trained at the beginning, like when I first got my black belt and I opened my school and I was teaching a bunch of total beginners in a town where there was no high level jujitsu uh, or even mid-level jujitsu. And, um, you know, I, like I had to try to level everybody up as much as possible. So I tried to make each guy that had an inclination in one direction as good as he could be. And like, you know, butterfly guard and that guy's more into half guard and that guy likes Kimors and et cetera, et cetera. And when I roll, I would just try to allow as many things to happen. And when you do the fuck your jujitsu stuff, yeah. because of the, the, the restrictions and, and the restrictions are, are one thing, it, you can be a lot more exploratory with it if you want. So like, you know, if, if my goal in fuck your jujitsu is to definitely not be swept, I can follow the rules, but I can react fairly early. You know, like if I'm rolling with Rory, and I let Rory grab both of my sleeves and establish, you know, X guard, well, I'm going to land on my face pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. I might be inclined to just, you know, do everything else, but never let him get a hold of my hands. 
Whereas if I'm rolling with a white belt or a blue belt or a purple belt or whatever, I might just walk in and be like, here you go. I'm a marionette. Try to sweep me. And then depending on how much I allow to happen, I will find myself in so many more you know, unique situations throughout the course of a week of training than you know, prior to training like this, which is really basically before I opened my school, where I, you know, I would show up at a club and if we rolled – we just fucking rolled as hard as we could until one guy tapped. Well, it, it does require you to be experimental. I mean, if you're going as hard as you can, you're probably going to stick to your A game. Exactly. And do everything. There's a great saying from Luta Livre, which is, if I don't know, I won't allow. Yeah. And that's great for competition it's and hard terrible rolling. For it's terrible for development. Yeah. Terrible for development. Yeah, and so because in development, it's almost the opposite. If I don't know. I allow. I, I, let's, let's see what find out. I did, if, yeah. So one of the things. There's an easy way out. Exactly, exactly. So one of the things that, um, you know, both because of these, uh, these teaching methods that I employ, and, but also just because I've been pretty fortunate in my life to be able to train at a lot of different places. Uh, and, 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 you know, prior to opening my school and, and, and after opening my school. Is that code for having been kicked out of a whole bunch of sequential, <laughs> places sequentially? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it's code for I lived out of a backpack and I traveled a lot. Uh, and even to this day, like I've got, um, I've got friends who own clubs all over Vancouver. You know, I, I teach seminars all over the Pacific Northwest and, you know, even when I'm able to get myself drugged up enough to get on a plane, uh, you know, whether it's California or, or Ontario, or whatever, like I've trained at so many different clubs with so many different people. And my goal in rolling is to explore and solve puzzles and you know, like see what happens. And the more I, you know, approach a role with the fuck your jujitsu mindset, the more that's going to happen. Uh, and fortunately I'm skilled enough to be able to do that with most people I roll with, you know, like obviously if I'm, if I visit, you know, uh, my coach, Kai Otera, I don't go into that role with a fuck your jujitsu mindset, like, because he can <laughs> fuck my jujitsu. All right. So like I roll a little bit differently, but still with the idea of growth in mind, it's just, I'm not going to be like, here, Kai, take my heart, you know, like. <laughs> Uh, I will bet you can't arm bar yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Bet you can't arm exactly. bar me. It's it's going to be very much let me explore as many situations as I can while really trying to closely observe what he's doing. I'm I'm way less concerned about what I'm doing. I'm more concerned with what he's doing. But the idea is I'm rolling to experience as many things as possible throughout the role. So if it's somebody who I can learn from because they're just better at jujitsu than I am, that's how I approach it. But I can also learn from somebody who's worse at jujitsu than I am by just letting them do whatever they want and then trying to figure out solutions. And so because of that, I, I, like, I really don't very often get into a role and be like, well, that's strange. I, I haven't been here before. Mm -hmm. We started with MMA, early MMA, 93, UFC 1, and how people's intuitions were wrong and how the essentially the the instincts on the ground honed by jiu-jitsu training were the right instincts for a fight. Mm -hmm. But then there's a fascinating period later than that, in mostly in Pride, when Sakuraba, you know, basically beat Hoyler, and then he beat Henzo, and then he beat Hyen, yeah. and then he beat Hoyce. And, you know, yes, Sakuraba was athletic. He probably had a lot of fast twitch muscle. He had an amazing ability to stay calm when all hell was breaking loose later in his career, that was definitely to his detriment. <laughs> yeah. If Vanderlei Silva is soccer kicking your head repeatedly, <laughs> you should be panicking. Yeah. Uh, but it was a great example of taking people out of their game. I think, you know, he would give up his back. And the first time I saw Sakuraba give up his back, I'm like, okay, it's over. And it wasn't over because he had, his game was so different, sort of catch wrestling based, wrestling based, shoot wrestling based and a, a sort of a different hierarchy and a different set of strategies. Oh, absolutely. So th this is something that is becoming a little bit more accepted now uh, is the, this like this fusion of wrestling and jujitsu. Uh, but for a little while there like this, you know, like you, you same way you hear like, Oh, you know, you, you never give up your back or you never cross your ankles. And these, but there's all these things that people would say, and heuristics. Yeah, heuristics. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
and the, the whole you know, like you know, don't give up your back one because the back is so dangerous is I mean it, don't get me wrong it, it's absolutely true but if somebody is really good at wrestling and they just stand up and you're trying to jump on their back while they do like it's one thing if somebody gets on your back and they get a body triangle and they get a seatbelt and they get both hooks in yeah fine but if you're attacking the turtle and the turtle is of a guy who's highly developed his wrestling defense and also is now informed by their submission grappling or their jujitsu training to the point where they can negate the most obvious attacks then all of a sudden giving up your back while launching their own while launching their own exactly people. then all of a sudden giving up your back is really not that big of a deal uh so yeah it's interesting like you know sakuraba may have been one of the first guys to like show the flaws in establishing too much of an orthodoxy around jujitsu that is based entirely around the rule set of jujitsu and the behaviors that it encourages and i think it's there was a time where people would conflate you know brazilian jiu-jitsu with overall grappling and submission grappling like okay this is the best system of grappling and therefore the the things that apply as best practices within this system of grappling are just best practices period when there are plenty of things that are best practices in wrestling or maybe in judo or whatever that are superior to some of the best practices in jiu-jitsu in specific circumstances and like, like i don't think that's very heretical to say now but five years ago ten years ago if somebody was like yeah well i'm just going to stand up and shake you off of me you'd be like well no you're crazy that that's you know so yeah i, I think that um there's a certain amount of frankly cultish thinking and fetishization of jujitsu uh you know and like i always i like to say that i i'm a i'm a jujitsu black belt but i'm a grappling instructor i teach people how to grapple um, there shouldn't be any sort of like, um, adherence seal or, of approval, yeah. yeah, seal of a brand seal. Yeah, of approval. exactly. Like it, it shouldn't be, yeah. Like there should be no brand loyalty to techniques. It's like, oh, this technique comes from jujitsu. Therefore I have to favor it over a technique that comes from wrestling. Like well, I look forward to your Krav Maga <laughs> jujitsu fusion, uh, video. <laughs> I, I've, I've got no comeback for that. That's just that's just, just well played. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, exactly. So, if you had to guess, what's the next thing that's going to be coming into either no gi or gi jiu jitsu that's going to take people totally out of their comfort zone and require a recalibration of this intuition? Uh, I, I mean, this isn't a guess. This is something that myself and several other instructors that are a, a hell of a lot more accredited than I am in, in terms of like competition accolades and stuff like that, uh, which is uh, create like cradles, uh, mm. cradle based passing, just cradle based attacks. Uh, this is something that I've been like incorporating into my game a little bit over the last few years. Um, I know that Braulio Estima has a like cradle based kind of gi. Uh, passing methodology. I know that Robert Drysdale is a big fan of cradles. Uh, so I, I definitely think that in, certainly in terms of fusing wrestling with jujitsu, where most guys are not going to have very developed uh, intuition. Hmm. Yeah. Cradles are definitely uh, going to be a thing. Yeah. I wonder if that'll be uh, very, very limited in a size range. I mean, there aren't many big guys at Barambolo. I wonder if there'll be not, be a lot of little guys who cradle i'm guessing not just they don't want get the they won't get the reps in at the club against the bigger guys yeah so that, that's where you get into like you know how good is your training methodology what are you focusing on because if you're a little guy you can definitely get good at the stuff it just depends on how you train it uh but it's a really good point uh, yeah m most most of the like higher level teams have got a, like some of the professional training stuff figured out but I would argue that a lot of it still, they don't. The, like the, the jiu-jitsu is still years, if not decades, and, and certainly decades behind some other professional sports in terms of how they train, uh, just because the money's not there. Uh, so I, I, like, I think given enough time, there's no reason that a smaller yeah, if guy... If you paid $50 million for some elite athlete to be on your team, and he's one of many, you're going to spend the additional two million dollars to figure out how to train those exactly guys properly exactly so who do you think is doing it correctly uh, now we're going to talk about sports outside of jiu-jitsu 
uh, which isn't a strong suit of mine, uh, unless we're talking uh, the very limited sports of firefighter combat challenge <laughs> or paddling. Yeah. Uh, but what uh, aspects of training or organization of training from other sports do you think we could incorporate and uh, benefit from? Oh, I, like, I mean, that, it, obviously the closest... I would argue recovery. Oh, I think hundred, the, so... So like, you know, when I was training initially, I was training MMA with like some jujitsu, like I, over the last decade, I've been entirely jujitsu. Uh, and like, I, I think the last time I put on a pair of boxing gloves was probably eight years ago. Uh, but the, um, like in the early days of MMA, the, the way that they trained was just barbaric <laughs> and it, it's, it's come a long way, but I still think MMA is behind boxing. So if we're going to look like as, as jujitsu practitioners, we can look to MMA and go, okay, they're ahead of us, but then boxing's ahead of them. So if we just want to stick with combat sports, like, I mean, I don't follow boxing as closely as I used to, but it's like, can you recall a, like a high level fight being called off because one of the participants got injured in training camp prior to the fight? Like when was the last time that happened? It happens all the time in MMA. Yeah. I, I would argue not to be contrarian, but I would argue that the nature of MMA is a little bit more prone oh, to orthopedic and, and injury. Like, I'm not saying it's the only factor. Like, obviously, yeah. MMA is more complex, but like, I, like I remember when I was at... I, but I can't think of any major boxing matches that have been called. Yeah, out, so what, what, what I would suggest is that there's a, a percentage of that uh, that's contributing to this, to this phenomenon is the fact that, yes, MMA is more complex. You're training more different things. Mm -hmm. Part of it is the way that they train. Part of it is the fact that you still have, you know, an, like a training area with multiple people sparring with each other where the, the single most dangerous aspect of MMA training is the wrestling because we're like, we're no longer in the shoot box days where you like knock each other out in sparring. So like the striking sparring is a lot more controlled. It's a lot more uh, properly applied. Generally. Generally. Yeah, yeah. No, generally, of course, of course. Um, but you've still got like, a dozen dudes in a training area where, but you know, it used to be 30, but you know, like some guy goes for a double blast the guy halfway across the room. And then that guy falls on another guy's ankle and blows the dude's knee out for well, if, like, there should, if you look at my face, you can see, I'm trying to line my head up straight. You see that one eye is lower in the head than the other. And that is from me being on the ground at the end of a takedown and another dude doing a takedown, throwing the guy's, his partner's heel right on directly into my face. Yeah. So blowout fracture of the orbital. Totally. Uh, I don't think that Roy Jones Jr. It, while preparing is, for is his fight with Tyson with... had to worry about getting run into by the by the big boxing beginner in the this same ring. This is range. exactly the, the, the thing, right? Like when, when we get to the point in MMA where a guy preparing for a fight is never in a room with anyone other than his specific sparring partner and his coaches... <laughs> Uh, and uh, there are guys that can do that now, right? Like, uh, you know, if you're Conor McGregor and you can invest a million dollars into a training camp or more, yeah, you can do that. But if you're just a, you're, if you're a, a dude who's going to make 40 grand to fight, you got no choice. You, you can't just like, so, so MMA because of the money, uh, is still behind where boxing is. Uh, so like, you know, like that's, that's one area. Uh, and then if you look at the, the analytics side of it, the like, and again, it, this is strictly a money thing. I'm not like, obviously if, if I could pay someone to do film analysis of every match that every guy in my bracket has ever had, that I might face has ever had and break down statistically what they like. Three to out of to, four times after he grabs your left ankle, he will move gonna, to a yeah. knee drag. Yeah, exactly. So if or we leg could, drag to set up the knee cut yeah. or whatever. So if we could do that, uh, then that'd be great. Like that's something that probably the NFL does sure. more that you're know, better than anybody in major league baseball is probably right up there as well. Uh, and then again, They're just like total stats nerds. Yeah, exactly. Now that has limited use in a single elimination tournament with a bracket of 40 people. So, but if you were talking super fights, which is a lot of the direction that, uh, you know, the higher level of uh, certainly Nogi is going, then that had would have tremendous value and I, and again like there are guys that do that right like obviously if you've got a match coming up with somebody you're studying tape but it, you know if if if, if like, let's say i was in that level which i'm not obviously 
where, okay, you know, I'm going to, let's say I'm going to have a match with Craig Jones. I've got to study his tape. Maybe my coach studies some of his tape, but every t like bit of time that we're devoting to that is time we're not devoting to something else. Mm -hmm. So if we had the money to hire a guy whose job it is to watch and then break things down, that would bring things to another level. Obviously, so like all of the, the, the things that we would do or we could do would be solved by money, but some of them could just be solved by being a little bit more um, just willing to explore and learn from you know what other professional sports are doing and apply it to jujitsu where there's still very much the mentality of come in and just roll really fucking hard a lot mm -hmm. and just bang it out in the gym and that's how you get ready for competition. Yeah. And then there's a survivor bias because you're the one guy out of the cohort of 10 yeah. who didn't blow his knee out, blow his back out, blow his neck out, blow his shoulder out, blow his wrist out. Exactly. Uh, or, so Yeah. And, and I mean, when, when we get to that point where those methods are more prevalent and we get to the point where more people are participating, you're going to see the level of jujitsu. And I mean, it's gone up so much. Like some of the guys coming out now that are like, you know, prospects, at 19 and 20, what they can do compared to what guys like guys weren't getting their black belts at 20 years old, uh, you know, a decade or two ago, you were 25, you were 28 and your first year at black belt, you got your ass kicked. Now it's like the day you get your black belt, you're expected to win worlds that year. Otherwise you're a failed prospect kind of thing. Right. So like the level is already so much higher than it was. If we apply a little bit more intelligent training, it's just going to get that much higher in five years and 10 years, et cetera. Right. Okay, Rob, this has been a really interesting conversation. Uh, how do people follow you on social? And if they wanted more Rob Bernanke, more conceptual stuff, you know, more BJJ concepts, concepts. for example, <laughs> they, where they, would they go? Where, yeah. Uh, oddly enough, they would go to bjjconcepts.net or .com. That is my online academy where you can learn both uh, like the specific concepts that I teach and some of the systems in the curriculum that I teach at my academy. But also we have a, and I still think this is fairly unique. Uh, we have a resource for instructors, which is it's called the pedagogy section where you can learn how to teach using the methods that we teach and, that, and how to run an academy. I so tried to talk you out of using oh, that like, name I, and you totally ignored me. And how's it working out? It's working out great. The, oh, uh, yeah, the, I, I, it's, it's funny. I like, obviously we don't have a, um, there's, there's no way to rerun the experiment. So it, in all possibility, you may have been right. And maybe if I called it the, the, you know, whatever the, the teach better you idiot section, I would have more <laughs> subscribers than I do. Uh, calling it the pedagogy section, but I, I I think that my you know fan base, if I have one, is it's basically it's nerds. It's syllabic. <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. They're it's 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 cerebral people. So I think calling it the pedagogy section didn't cost me as much as it would have if I was, uh, you know, if I was appealing to a, a different demographic, shall we say? Uh, so yeah, th that's um that's 2020, where you can... 20, Rob learns tact. <laughs> The, um, so yeah, if you want to, it hasn't it, been a total dumpster fire, but it still has, if, if this is what it took to teach me tact, I submit <laughs> that it was not worth it. Um, uh, the, uh, the site is where you can give me money. If you're inclined, if you don't want to give me money, but you just want to see, you know, pictures of stuff I do, uh, I'm on Instagram at, uh, Island top team and, um, and, uh, at BJJ concepts is the Instagram for the, for the site. So. Awesome. Yeah, normally I would pimp my visiting student program and tell you to come and hang out and train with me on Vancouver Island, but we're going to have to wait at least a few more months before that's possible. But when it is, uh, islandtopteam.com is my academy website. Just uh, let us know that you're interested in visiting and we'll find a way to get you here. Yeah. All right, Rob. Thank you so much. Have a good night and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Stefan. Mm -hmm.